Hi, and thanks for joining the Talking Animals Law and Philosophy series. My name is Raphael Fazel. I am the co-director of the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. Uh, this is the fourth event in uh, the Lent term programme of our Talking Animals series. And we're particularly excited to have everyone here because we've got one of our visiting researchers who's going to be presenting their research. Uh, before I introduce them, I'm just going to say a few words about the, the series and how this event is going to work. Uh, we will start with a presentation by our speaker that will last somewhere between 30 and 45 uh, minutes. Um, I will have all the, the microphones on mute until we reach the discussion part of this event after the, the talk itself. Uh, as always, everyone's invited to come in in the discussion if you have questions, comments, remarks please feel free to share them. Um, I would encourage you to do so using the uh, raise hand function that you can find on the bottom of your Zoom app. Just tap on the reaction smiley and you'll have the, the raise hand uh, button there. Uh, if you're in a train somewhere or would just prefer to put it in the chat, that's fine too. You can just uh, pop it in there and then I can feed that to our, our speaker. Um, we will be recording the presentation part of this event, but not the, the Q&A and the discussion. So you don't have to feel inhibited if you do want to come in in the discussion. The event itself will end at 6.30 p.m. UK time, if that's the time zone you're, you're joining us from. Okay, that's all as far as the uh, formalities of this event is concerned. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, and that's Dr. L. Jones. L. Jones is a poet, journalist, and prison, a prison abolitionist in uh, Nova Scotia. She received her PhD in cultural studies from Queen's University, and she is an assistant professor in the Department of Politics, Economics, and Canadian Studies at Mount St. Vincent University in Canada. Elle was the fifth poet laureate of Halifax, and she was a fellow of the International Writing Program at the University of Iowa. She was the lead author of the report called Defunding the Police, Defining the Way Forward for HRM, and her book called Abolitionist Intimacies, which was published by Fernwood Press in 2022, was the winner of the Evelyn Richardson Award for Nonfiction. Elle comes to animal studies through her work on policing, prisons, and state violence. And as I mentioned, uh, she's currently also a visiting researcher here at the Cambridge Centre for Animal Rights Law. Today, Elle will be speaking to us uh, about her research called Dogaganda, How the State Uses Dogs to Manufacture Consent for Violence. Uh, Elle, it's a pleasure having you here. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, as the light dies, my face may disappear because I don't have great lighting, but hopefully we'll just be listening together. I'm going to share my screen. So just give me a moment. And I want to thank the center so much for uh, supporting this work. All right. Okay, can you all see the slideshow? Perfect. Yes. All right, so uh, the first point I want to start with is just perhaps an obvious point, but that animals are present and are weaponized at every phase of state violence. So whether that's been the use of forces traditionally, historically in the military, um, the CIA uh, both tried to use pigeons and dolphins as spies. So we've seen a continual use of animals in the cause of state violence and perhaps no animal more than dogs. So. This is an example of the kind of uh, propaganda we often see. You'll get hundreds of pages of this if you Google uh, Marines rescue dogs from Afghanistan, uh, Marines rescue dogs from Iraq, et cetera. So this is a very well-worn piece of military propaganda that both of course paints the military as compassionate and saving animals, and also suggests that those whom they're saving animals from, in this case, Muslims, the Middle East, are less civilized because of their lack of care for animals. And this is a very common piece of propaganda that we'll see very quickly. You also see this historically. So hero dogs in World War II, this hero dog from Vietnam. So we'll often again see the elevation of animals as heroic in the cause of the state. Current conflict, uh, Aisha, the IDF's canine amid controversy. So uh, the use of a dog, you'll note the Muslim name for the dog, Aisha, which is 
obviously also an act of Islamophobia. This other headline is interesting, feral dogs from Gaza invade Israel. Um, I've seen versions of this, so I've also seen dogs attack IDF. So depending on which side you're reporting from, you'll get a different kind of headline around this. So I just show these, and there's just endless examples that whenever we're in a conflict, whenever the state is engaged in violence, you will see dogs used and weaponized in this way. But we're going to talk specifically about police dogs today. So I'm going to start, and this video may not play. Is All right, I don't know if it's going, oh, here we go. Um, so those of you who are not Canadian won't be familiar with this. This is quite a big event in Canada. So this summer in July, a police dog named Bingo was allegedly killed by a suspect who was fleeing the police. And this led to a large public funeral. Um, there were, in fact, multiple events commemorating Bingo. So there was a funeral, then there was a commemoration service. We're going to watch about just a few not the whole thing, but a little bit of the news report just to hear some of the kind of discourse that we saw. Hopefully this works. As a canine officer, our dogs become our partners. We are a team. We look after each other. What we do cannot be done by one of us alone. To be successful, a canine handler needs their dog, and their dog needs their handler. Even after going through 16 weeks of extensive training with Bingo and seeing the remarkable transformation. Right, and then it goes from there. So I'm going to, we don't have time to watch the whole thing. You're welcome to watch it. But even in that brief uh, explanation, in that brief video, you can see, first of all, um, there's an interesting phenomenon that I'm going to talk about later, which is people bringing their dogs to these kind of funerals. So put a pin in that. But we already heard, uh, this dog is our partner, uh, dogs are officers, they are heroes, they sacrifice themselves. So we see this very moral language and the dogs are elevated to the status of heroes. And this will take place whenever police dogs die um, at the hands of suspects. So this kind of um, invocation of the animal human bond. So we can say that police dogs, perhaps more than any other animal, are perhaps the highest status animal we can imagine in the way that we speak about them. Um, unlike animals that are in industrial agriculture, police animals are given human qualities, they're allowed to be heroes, their deaths are mourned, um, unlike, of course, the millions of animals, billions of animals that die anonymously every year. Uh, let's see if I can get to this next slide. Um, so just some examples of the kind of public discourse we saw. Um, so Doug Ford on the right, that's the premier of Ontario. Um, he invoked the idea of being an animal lover. So as an animal lover, I'm very concerned. So we saw a lot of this mobilization of you love dogs, therefore you mourn the police dog. Um, on the left, we see again, another sort of common facet of discourse. So they are not animal, they are our partners and they gave the life to protect others. These are not animals. So we see how a police dog is elevated from a state beyond the animal, which of course raises the question of what's wrong with being an animal? Why does a dog not have to be an animal as such in order to be glorified and celebrated? Um, of course, at the same time, so while there was a kind of orgy, what uh, Justin Pichet has called the penal spectacle, so the notion that uh, when police memorialize themselves, they engage in these public uh, performances in order to both show us the authority of the police, often drawing upon the iconography of military uh, memorials or funerals in order to connect the police to the state and patriotism. Uh, why are we seeing this kind of funeral for bingo? And why have we seen since the release, I would say 1998 onwards, a real increase in Canada and other places in things like the memorialization of police dogs? And part of this, of course, is the increase of critique of the police. So here's just some headlines that show you the kinds of critiques that the Toronto police has been subject to uh, in the summer of 2022, I think. Um, the police had to apologize preemptively for a use of force report that showed that they used force, uh, I think it was uh, 1.6 times the amount of the population on Black people, and this included things like strip searching. There was other reports that showed that Black people were 20 times more likely to be shot by the police, even when you controlled for a weapon. So in other words, an, an armed white person was far less likely to be shot by the police than an unarmed Black person. So we've seen consistent critique of the police over racial profiling. 
Um, they also had to do a large settlement due to the G20 protests, which had been described by some as one of the largest violations of civil rights in Canadian history. So this is where they illegally arrested protesters. It was cattling. People were illegally detained, and that led to a large settlement. Um, and then, of course, people may be familiar with Black Lives Matter. Um, so in 2016, Toronto Black Lives Matter quite famously stopped the Pride Parade and demanded that police be removed from Pride. So particularly in the last decade, we have seen all kinds of critique of the police. And when we see this kind of critique, we see increasingly propaganda around police dogs mobilized in order to reify this love for the police and kind of end run around these critiques as well. But interestingly, of course, so we had a funeral for Bingo. The very same day, perhaps by coincidence, uh, eight police dogs, not in Canada, in Michigan, but eight police dogs died in transport after the truck's air conditioning broke down in traffic. Um, so in fact, 19 dogs ended up in either hospitalized, harmed, or dead. Um, so these dogs were transported without air conditioning. When they were removed from the van after the driver heard barking after a couple of hours, the dogs were malnourished and had, according to the Humane Society, long-term signs of abuse. So you see, I don't like to put pictures of wounded and harmed animals up, but if you look at the pictures, you see emaciated dogs, for example. And Humane Society cited uh, tremendous red flags, so not only in the transport of the dogs, that had pre-existed where the dogs had been put on the transport. And when these dogs died, their dead bodies were thrown back into the truck and they were transported to the destination alongside the live dogs that remained. And there was a, a quick investigation by the police themselves and the police were cleared of any wrongdoing. I want to note something here because you'll note that it just says eight police dogs die in transport. So the dogs are anonymized here. So when Bingo dies, uh, at the hands of a suspect. Bingo is an officer. He's a fallen hero. He's a soldier. He died and sacrificed himself to save all of us. He's selfless. But now when dogs die in transport, they are referred to as animals and canines, and we will never know the names of all of these dogs. So what we see here is, of course, a double standard. And this double standard is actually reiterated in the law. So in Canada, we have a law called Quanto's Law. And this is named after a police dog who was killed by a fleeing suspect in Edmonton in 2013. And this is kind of the culmination of more than a decade of advocacy by both the Humane Society and police groups to increase penalties for harming police dogs. And by 2015, they had successfully uh, got a law they had been advocating for, which promises, um, it doesn't actually really manifest this way, but at least theoretically promises enhanced sentencing if you harm a law enforcement officer as a dog. So it applies to military dogs, police dogs, and also allegedly assistive services dogs. Um, you won't be perhaps surprised to know that it's never been applied in the case of assisted services dogs that I can find. But as we've seen already, this double standard is that it is only for dogs that are harmed uh, while they're on duty, but it does not apply to animals off duty. So the dogs that died in the truck would not have counted. They were not on duty as such. In 2021, a Calgary police officer was caught on video kicking his dog during a high-risk takedown, and the officer was not charged or disciplined. And in fact, there was quite a bit of victim blaming of the dog. So the police spoke about, well, the dog was barking. So you know, while we don't condone the officer, the dog could have interrupted a high-risk uh, takedown. And in fact, that dog was sent home with the handler immediately. And again, the officer was acquitted. So you can see on the side that the officer kicked a dog and there was no discipline at all. So in other words, when dogs are harmed in a way that benefits the police, harmed by suspects, then the dogs are heroes. When the dogs are harmed by the police themselves, there's no penalty at all. So what does this show you? There's a weaponization of dogs, and this is a double weaponization. So they're weaponized as violent tools of policing. So obviously dogs are trained to bite, pursue suspects, um, dogs work in many areas of policing, including drug sniffing, search and rescue, but of course also takedown of criminals. And they also serve as useful propaganda for the police as well. Uh, in 2014, the Pivot Legal Society in Vancouver issued a report on police dogs and public safety. And this report showed that police dog bites are among the most frequent and dangerous of injuries. Um, so at the time, uh, they said that bites were the leading cause of injury at the hands of municipal police, exceeding by a factor of six injuries incurred by all other forms of non-lethal force, which included batons, pepper spray, uh, beanbag rounds, and among the most debilitating injuries at all. 
as well. And I will add that um, despite this, they very rarely actually make their way up to inquiry. So we have uh, police like IIU or CERT that are supposed to inquire into injuries caused by the police. And for some reason, there's a gap. And despite the serious amount of injuries from police dog bites, they quite rarely get investigated, which is a kind of interesting gap as well. So we can see that dogs are used in an incredible amount of violence and an incredible amount of harm. And of course, I want to point out here that we know the dogs are not consenting, right? Like a dog doesn't say, I want to be a cop. The dogs are obviously being used non-consensually in this. So when I speak about the weaponization of dogs, I'm not blaming the dogs here. I'm saying that dogs are being weaponized um, by the police in this manner. Some data as well. Um, so police dog bites are not racially neutral. In Ferguson, for example, so familiar from Mike Brown and the Ferguson uprisings, which really kicked off the Black Lives Matter movement, 100% of dog bites in Ferguson were against Black people. Um, I believe the NAACP in Louisiana has been engaged in a lawsuit looking at uh, dog bites in Black people. So in the United States, there's some data that shows that dog bites are extremely racially unequal. That data has been very hard to get in Canada. If you're Canadian, that won't be a surprise to you. Uh, we actually very much do not gather data and do not specifically gather race disaggregated data. So it's very difficult. I've been inquiring for over two years and they simply either won't give it to me or say it doesn't exist. Um, but a piece of data that we do have in Toronto, again, the site of Bingo's funeral, is that although Black people make up less than 9% of the population, they make up uh, 57.1% of incidents involving a police dog. So we see a huge racial disparity in dog bites here. Um, we also know that dog bites have been increasing. So uh, between 2015 and 2019, we went from 297 dog bites against civilians to an average of 430 dog bites each year. So we know that dogs are increasingly being used. And just, uh, sorry, there's a lot of words on this slide, but in a personal communication with Scott Wortley, who provided the only piece of data that I had, he spoke about the difficulty in getting this data. So the only way they got the Toronto data was really going through the raw data by hand, and this is how they were able to get this. But uh, there's a huge data gap as well around the keeping of any kind of statistics on police dogs, which I think is telling in a lot of ways. Um, so that's Black people. I've been looking into the data for Indigenous people in Canada. So those of you who are not Canadian, um, Black people are over incarcerated in Canada, but we have a particular um, disproportionate incarceration of Indigenous people. If you're familiar with the residential school system, which was a system where children were separated forcibly from their families. It's a genocide, right? Children were put into residential schools where they were abused. Uh, the culture was forcibly taken from them, and this lasted for generations and has a continuing impact on Indigenous people. Many people refer to the prison system as the new residential schools to see that continuation of colonial violence. So if you look through the records, um, if you look at lawsuits, reports, what makes it up to investigation, it's quite clear that disproportionately dog bites are directed at Indigenous people, but again, that data is not kept. But in one example here, um, this is memorials for a Wet'suwet'en man named Jared Lowndes, who was killed in an encounter with a police dog in Tim Horton's parking lot when they were executing a warrant on him. Um, so he was homeless and uh, the police dog came through the window. He stabbed the dog and he was shot and killed and the dog named Gator also died. And I'm going to hopefully, if we have time, speak in more detail about that later. But this is Jared's memorial and then the memorial for the police dog Gator who died. And you can see this, I bet you were a good dog written in child handwriting. Very, very common in the memorializing of police dogs as well, the use of children in order to draw upon the notion that animals are innocent. Um, so we know, in other words, um, I can suppose that indigenous people are also disproportionately represented in this violence. It's a continuation of colonial violence as well, but I don't have that data. So as we saw, even in the brief clip that I showed you, um, we'll see the use of words like family, partner, uh, sacrifice, courage, selflessness, warrior, all of these terms will be used and directed towards police dogs. Um, they're also the bond between handler and animal is glorified. So not only is the dog himself, and it generally is a, a male dog, glorified, there's also an idea that this is the kind of apotheosis of the kind of human animal connection that we want. And we will often see public discourse laud this connection, that this is the human animal connection. So we might as animal 
people think, well, this is good, right? We want animals to transcend this animal human binary. This is what we want. We want animals to be closer to the human. We want to see animals as not just beasts. Isn't this good then? That for once an animal is being uh, recognized for their moral qualities, they're being understood as a partner for humanity. All of those things seem like they might be positive. Um, so it seems that these animals transcend this human animal divide and become a kind of exemplar of what we might want. Um, but like the double standard in the law, there's actually a fundamental contradiction that we see between this kind of rhetoric on police dogs and the actual reality of how police dogs are used. Um, so every stage of a police dog's life and death is instrumentalized by the state, and particularly up to and including their death, uh, which will, as I've already showed you, be mobilized and used in order to support the police. Um, here you see an example, police officer charged after dog abandoned in trash bag. This actually isn't that uncommon. Um, about 13 to 30% of police dogs make it through training, and uh, there's not really any tracking of the dogs once they fail out of training. And there have been cases where the dogs are revealed to be discarded or abused. There have been cases in Canada as well where dogs have been found in the garbage. Um, these dogs are often turned high-risk dogs. Uh, they can't socialize with other dogs. They are actually trained to bite, quite obviously, but even from a young age, they will talk about when the dogs are being fostered as puppies, that they're allowed to bite the furniture and bark and jump on things because you want them to have that to be a police dog. So in other words, the kind of training that you would give a dog in order to be a pet is quite publicly not uh, encouraged for police dogs. And they will say, this dog is not a pet, they should not be treated as a pet. And you'll see that in their rhetoric, which means what happens when the dog is not making it as a police officer. Uh, what kind of life does that dog have? Um, quickly, just to talk about Quando's Law, just to go back there. And this is the importance of naming. Um, so I said that Quanto is a police dog that died in 2013. Um, a law was named for him. Um, this is just an interesting fact that uh, the naming of laws is not neutral. Um, laws are named for ideal victims and they show who is valued. Uh, for example, the vast majority of laws are named for white victims. Um, there's very few 6% of laws in the US are named for black people. So again, you see this interesting elevation of police dogs who transcend these kind of boundaries, but in the name of this carceralism, right? That we're going to name this law for this animal because he's a police animal who matters. Of course, you would never see laws named after industrial animals, like uh, farms, factory farmed animals would never rise to the level of having their names. So. How does one, this picture is ridiculous. <laughs> How does one become a police dog? Um, so that is actually a process and it's an important part of thinking about the move that police dogs make from animal to adjacent to the human to officer. Uh, Knight and Sang did a study in 2020 where they looked at actually in a UK context, um, as they call it, dogs as organizational actors. And they emphasize that there's a complex process of becoming that happens for a police dog. Um, so as they go through training and then are used, they uh, enter a higher status. So as they say, police dogs are placed within a speciesist hierarchy, but they hold the position of good non-human animals rather than instrumental tools of the organization. However, the position is tenuous, with dogs' retirement often resulting in death. And one of the things they also point out is that uh, police dogs are often contrasted to so-called criminal dogs, which will be pit bulls, or Rottweilers or other dogs often that are seen as gang dogs. And therefore, for example, in the very same breath as the police will hold up police dogs and say animal lovers, they will kill your companion animal if they're raiding your home. Um, so you will see police shoot dogs as part of their policy because those dogs are seen as criminal dogs. So we also see this division and another double standard with animals. So to just sort of walk through um, some of the process of becoming a dog, the first thing is that there's a very pseudoscience eugenics uh, kind of notion to all of this. Um, so the very notion of dog breeds owes a lot to the 19th century uh, story of racial hierarchies. So the American Kennel Club starts in the uh, like, mid-1800s. And so we actually see a co-mobilization at the same time as racial science is in vogue, that humans are placed in a hierarchy due to natural different characteristics. We see that applied to dog breeding. And that is something that was quite open at the time. So the notion that dog breeds all have specific characteristics and they have pure blood and this dog is a better breed and more trainable than this dog owes a lot to 19th century race science. And I think that's important to think about. 
Um, so German Shepherds are generally preferred as police dogs, although you will see sometimes Rottweilers, Dobermans, or other breeds used. On the right, I thought this was a quite comical headline, Alsatians are just poodles, say <laughs> police who prefer Rottweilers. So we see this kind of breed discourse. You'll also notice that it's always purebred dogs. So, you know, mongrels, mixed breed dogs, are not seen as trainable or desirable. And there's no reason for that. This is all breed pseudoscience around, you know, which dogs are trainable, which dogs are aggressive, et cetera. Um, you'll also see male dogs uh, are considered more trainable, and particularly for the dogs that are involved in pursuing biting suspects are almost overwhelmingly male. And they also believe that intact male dogs are more trainable than neutered dogs. Uh, which they claim is, you know, an objective science, I suspect has more to do with a kind of macho, uh, you know, the, the dog can't be castrated and it's, it's not a cop, it's not a real man. So I think it's actually just patriarchal uh, projection onto the animals. But there's a belief that uh, non-neutered dogs are uh, better cops as well. So this is from uh, the RCEMP website, in fact. So you can see that they began their own breeding program in 1999. Um, they talk about control over prices or availability. They have 18 breeding females that live with civilians close to our kennels, and they now produce, look at the language here, this instrumental language, 100 pups every year. So we have a mixture of, again, pseudo breed science that you pick specific dogs that will produce the future police dogs. We can, of course, in a gendered way, think about how the female dogs are literally just being constantly impregnated in order to produce these dogs, 100 pups a year between 18 breeding females. That's a quite high volume as such. So we can think about how, again, like the female dogs are exploited in order to create enough dogs for the attrition of police training to take place. Um, I just recently got my hands on the RCMP training manual. I was trying to get it for a year and I only got it about a week ago. It's fascinating. Um, it's from 2011. And it, again, contains a lot of pseudoscience and uh, outdated uh, theories on dog behavior and training. Um, I'm not expecting you to read all this text. On the left is their training philosophy, which is based, again, on the animal bond. And they very much will glorify this bond. So you have to like your dog, as they say. Um, they talk very much about the importance of a handler and a dog having um, you know, a connection. Um, so we see that elevated. But then we also see a very outdated pseudoscience around dogs as subordinate animals. So this section says, do dogs reason? And they tell us that dogs are not capable of reason. They can ask why. They have less uh, reasoning ability than a child. And therefore, a dog only learns through conditioning and learned behavior. So this is, of course, out of step with most contemporary uh, knowledge around how animals learn. And we also, again, see a contradiction here, which is very common in the discourse around police dogs, that you constantly see this contradiction going on. So on the one hand, they're moral creatures, they're selfless, they're sacrificing their officers, but they also can't reason. So they're imbued with these qualities like courage, but then they say, well, no, they actually can't have that voluntarily because they can't actually think. So, you know, this is just a learned behavior. So you see a kind of contradiction in the way there's a moral frame that's created, but then consistently undermined, and we're reminded these are only animals. I like this, there are naturally just those dogs who don't have it, uh, that's a quote. I was talking about this talk actually this morning to a physiotherapist and he said it reminded him of elite sports where you know people are used up and then only a certain amount make it in the sport and they're willing to damage the bodies and psychologies of everybody else. And I said, that's a really good analogy because that's what we see happening. A large amount of dogs going into training, a small amount of dogs that so-called make it and the rest of the dogs just disappear and we don't know anything about it, much like he suggested you would see in sports. Um, so again, we see uh, knows it for a dog and only a dog. So this language, ungendered language of the ungendered object, it, it is only a dog. This is an animal. So again, you see this uh, emphasis that you don't, don't think your dog's anything better than an animal. But then if the dog dies, it's more than an animal, right? Um, you also see this on the RCMP website. You'll see how they consistently um, connect the characteristics of police dogs with the characteristics of officers. So courageous, um, the same moral characteristics you would want from an officer are projected onto the dogs. Uh, so qualities for our police dogs, you'll note again, there's a kind of moral frame here. So they don't just say trainable behavior. 
they talk about these as moral issues. So and then you see the same qualities in the dog handler, but again, you see this language, remember, it's only a dog. Well, I thought they were officers. So one of the officers and one of the only animals. And then of course, disposability. Um, so this is a headline, meet major, he was a very good cop, now he's retired and expensive. So what we see is once dogs, are, at every stage of training, dogs are discarded. So if a dog doesn't make it in the training program, um, you will see constantly dogs removed from the kennels, dogs that, as I said, like are disposed of during training, they're interchangeable with each other. If a dog isn't working out, then that dog will be discarded and another dog will be added in. And even the dogs that have spent their life serving, once they can no longer serve, become disposable. So again, we're told these are officers, they're our partners, but even something we might say is the bare minimum, that once a dog has served, surely they should receive a pension or health care or be supported in some way, they're not. And it becomes the responsibility of the handlers to care for those dogs. And should a handler not be able to, again, these are labeled high-risk dogs. Um, they are not able to be socialized with other dogs. They can't simply go to any household. Um, they also have a high degree of spinal injuries and skeletal injuries from jumping in and out of cruisers and from the high intensity training they do. They have psychological injury due to their training. Uh, drug sniffing dogs are actually addicted to drugs after a certain amount of time. So we have all kinds of violence that has been done to the dogs and there's no care for them once they're finished. Um, when we're speaking about dog propaganda, uh, this is particularly directed at youth. This is again a frame from Justin Pichet and Kevin Walby who talk about how police memorials and museums, what they call youth predation. So they particularly predate upon children in order to um, get them into loving the police and supporting the police. And police dogs are hugely used in this. So name the puppy contest. And again, you'll see the emphasis on naming, naming, naming. And so police dogs, you could say hinges. If you have a name, then you're important as a police dog. If you lose your name, then you're no longer important. Um, so name the puppy contest, a very common thing. Well, they'll say, you know, they go through the alphabet and children get prizes for naming these cute puppies. It's a very common form. Um, you also, of course, Paw Patrol, recently a hit movie is perhaps the biggest public example of a police dog being used in youth propaganda. So uh, Chase, the Paw Patrol dog, has like a surveillance drone. <laughs> this article is very funny because people like, euthanize the police dog. All, all, <laughs> all dogs are good except police dogs. So uh, you see, again, like how this is directed at youth. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when that propaganda goes wrong, this is a case in Winnipeg. <laughs> And it, it really illustrates how the rhetoric around training and these dogs is not at all, again, what it seems. So the way they talk about it is these dogs are impeccably trained, you know, like they, they don't make mistakes. Like they're these perfect dogs. But when you actually look, there's a lot of times where that training is failing. The dogs are biting officers, which, okay, good to know. And they often bite members of the public. So, of course, this notion that you can take a dog, teach it violence, and then you can somehow constantly direct that violence is not really borne out. So this is a case in Winnipeg where a police dog was brought into a school to meet five-year-olds and the children were supposed to line up to pet the dog. This child tripped uh, when in line and the dog savaged the child's face. I'm not showing you the picture, but the child's lip was completely uh, ripped open. Um, the dog, there was no charges laid against the officer or the dog. And of course the family is speaking out about like our child was harmed. He's terrified now. He's got all this trauma nothing happened. Um, so in this attempt to predate on youth and bring dogs into the school, this went badly wrong. And when it goes wrong, there's no discussion of perhaps this kind of training isn't sustainable. Perhaps you can't simply mold a dog into a weapon and then think there's not going to be any consequences. And then finally, of course, for the death of dogs. And I've named this, I've identified this as necropolitics. So these are two dog memorials. And interestingly, uh, dog memorials in Canada tend to be located at the very kennels where the dogs are housed. So on the left, we have the National Police Dog Monument that was erected in 2007 at Innisfail, which is the RCMPs, that's our National Police Force, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. That's their training facility, breeding facility, and kennels. Um, so this is a memorial. There was a large push from about 1998 onwards to 2007 to build this memorial. And you can see they finally did but they're located where the living dogs train. Um, so this is not actually for the public, whereas police museums locate themselves in ways to be open that the police can come through. Dog memorials tend to be located near the living dogs. And it suggests again, a kind of instrumentalization of these dogs death, that their death 
is necessary in some ways. It's okay if they die because the police will still benefit. On the right, we have another memorial for Edmonton dogs. This is at the Valley Rand Kennels, which is where the Edmonton police house their dogs. And you can see a similar um, idea that you'll see the names of the dogs on the memorial. So the dead dogs' names are inscribed. Here it says, through this gate, past the finest police service dog. So you can literally see this location. Um, so nobody has actually really studied police dog memorials, and I find them fascinating, that and police dog obituaries, because they demonstrate exactly what I'm talking about. So if you read, for example, the obituary for Quanto, the police dog for whom the law is named, um, on the one hand, again, you see this valorization, but underneath that, there's all these kind of reading between the lines cues of the disposability of police dogs. So they'll say, oh, I got Quanto after another dog struggled in trading and I had to get rid of that dog and that dog will not be named. So even within police dog uh, obituaries, we often see how the dogs are used and how, you know, in many ways, their position is so precarious. Um, the other thing I find really interesting is how the police dog memorials the push for them politically was heavily accompanied by a push for carceral law. So um, when they were erecting the National Dog Police Monument, it was co-constituted with a push, particularly for high school students, to write to their MPs in order to both demand a memorial and to demand harsher law to people who kill police dogs. So we see how those things kind of ended up hand in hand. And interestingly, when they open the National Police Dog Monument, when they unveil it, uh, they actually, at the same time, award a child for name the dog police dog contest. So you have, oh, we're going to give this 11-year-old child a prize for naming a puppy who may or may not make it through training. And then we're going to valorize the dead dogs. And then let's not pay attention to what happens to those dogs in between. Um, so what do I mean by necropolitics? So Achille Mbembe uh, defines this as the subjugation of life to the power of death. And many people who are animal scholars have looked at this in the context of animals in farming. So the slaughterhouse is a site of natural political praxis. Um, so we know that uh, animals in farming are just designated for death. Their entire life is just instrumentalized towards being killed. And so we might think again that a police dog is separate from that. They're not the same as a dog. Uh, they're not the same as a pig that's named for slaughter from birth. But in fact, as I'm suggesting here, um, in the ways that police dogs' deaths are seen as necessary, or at least tolerable, or at least usable, in fact, much of the same idea that these animals are instrumental for our own needs and ends are actually embodied in this kind of politics. And I think that's particularly embodied by placing a memorial for dead dogs in the very place where the living dogs live and work. Um, you can also see this like little poem on the memorial, my eyes are your eyes. So again, you know, you get this idea like, I'm you, you're me, but you're not me because you can be killed and I'm not going to be. Um, so, you know, you see that as well. Um, this is Quanto's uh, memorial. So I talked to you about obituaries and just very quickly, you can sort of see an example of this. So I received Quanto after another dog struggled in training. So you see the disposable interchangeability and the anonymization that dogs are subject to. So we see at every point, a dog can be elevated to this high status, but at any point that can be removed from them and they return back to a bestial anonymous state. And then of course we have this finally mobilization of love. So if you love dogs, then you love the police. And so what this propaganda draws upon is a love and connection with animals, which then becomes uh, transformed into, therefore, if you love dogs, and these are the best kind of dogs possible, so therefore you must love the police. And therefore, if you critique the police during something like a police dog funeral, so if you say, oh, isn't that a lot of cost for a dog? Um, you know, really, should we be spending hundreds of thousands of millions parading a dog coffin through the streets? Then you are a hateful, awful person who doesn't love animals. So you get this conflation that love for dogs equals love for police and equals love for the state. Uh, this is actually a friend of mine who uh, tweeted at Bingo's funeral, fuck Bingo. And then the right wing performed this like outrage. How could you like what kind of terrible monster doesn't love dogs? Um, so you again see this mobilization of love. But if we truly love dogs, we'd probably consider whether or not, and I would say we should not be instrumentalizing them in state violence, exposing them to this kind of risk and injury and harm. Love for animals means not using animals to our own end, not uh, manipulating them, weaponizing them, uh, ignoring their agency and forcing them into this kind of service. Um, and so again, you see this like phenomenon where people bring their own dogs to police dog funerals. And it's like, I'm a good owner. And these, it's, it's very strange. Like, 
the idea that you would show up at a funeral for police dog with your own dog. So this kind of sentimentality is consistently mobilized. I don't know how much time I have. Um, okay, I'll do this very quickly in like five minutes, maybe, just to give you one example. So I won't do all these slides. And this is actually kind of how I got into this work, um, was working with families who had uh, people die during encounters with police dogs. And I was really trying to put these pieces together as somebody that believes that animals are full beings that have every right to life and liberty and everything that we have, but can also recognize an animalizing discourse that occurs for Black people and Indigenous people in relation to dogs. So one of the challenges here is that rightfully so, many Black people, Indigenous people will say, well, you love dogs more than you love us. A Black person gets killed by police, you don't care. Police dog gets killed, you care. But that sets up a kind of opposition where either we can care about our lives as Black people or we can care about dogs. And I was interested in trying to bring this together, that how are they actually connected? How, like, we don't have to oppose those rights, but this is kind of how I got into this. So this is a case of an Indigenous man, what Sudan man, and I told you he was shot in a counter with the police. And you'll notice that um, the police did three tributes to the dog, Gator, uh, before they even named the Indigenous man in the media. And when Jared's family held a memorial for him, uh, that memorial was vandalized and people drove by saying a dog is worth more than a worthless criminal. So we saw here an elevation of police dog over the lives of an indigenous man. And this is again, the ways that police dogs become mournable. So normally you would say an animal is less mournable than a human, but in the case of police dogs that gets reversed and Gator was granted these human qualities as officer and Jared as a criminal became animalized. Um, so we can think here about this concept of bare life where the indigenous man is removed from the human by virtue of his crime against the dog and the dog is conditionally elevated to the human but only because of his adjacency to state violence and power so it's only by performing violence against an indigenous man that the dog is able to conditionally become human um, so i would suggest that he becomes mournable not only because he's an officer not in spite of the violence that he engages in but because of it this is actually what makes police dogs admissible to the human. Um, I'll skip forward a bit, but you can kind of see these tweets where people are like, oh, he was more than a worthless human. Um, just some of the memorials. Uh, interestingly enough, in this case, Jared actually had a dog and his family has suggested that when the police dog Gator came through the window, one reason why Jared might've fought back is he was protecting the puppy that he had in the car with him. But because that puppy interrupts the story of animal compassion, that Jared is a terrible person because he killed a police dog, that dog does not appear in any of the public discourse around Jared. That dog is not named, that dog does not exist. So the, the dog that may have been protected by Jared cannot exist because we need to paint Jared as uncivilized and unhuman because he harmed a police dog. So we see here this process of animalization of an indigenous human that, so the idea that these are two exclusive things. If a police dog is to become human only, then indigenous people must become less human in response. And then finally, I'm trying to go fast. Um, this is actually not uncommon in the way the law is, is uh, implemented. So when I started looking at how Quanto's law is actually used, um, first of all, it may not surprise you to know that it actually doesn't really result in like higher sentences. <laughs> it's like a matter of days or months. So despite being this kind of symbolic law, we're gonna actually punish people, they don't. So it's just more or less a law that's there to say it. In fact, they frequently still charge people under animal cruelty laws, particularly when it's harm to disabled assistance dogs. Um, but actually, kind of perhaps in an illustrative way, the very first person that was charged under this law is a man named Ryan Priste, a Métis man, so uh, Indigenous. And that case actually becomes a really important case in the fight against solitary confinement because he ends up spending 400 days in solitary confinement while he's awaiting trial. And I raise this to say that, um, as Justin Marceau talks about, when we engage in animal carceral law, that what we need is higher penalties. Um, it places animal justice out of step with the justice movements that other groups are engaged in. So as we say, we need to decarcerate indigenous people. We need to look at how the prison system is a settler colonial site of violence. Then you're like, okay, uh, we're gonna have more penalties to indigenous people who are the most likely to be bitten by police dogs or pursued by police dogs, because we know there's a racial disparity. And when you read through the case law, um, it's dubious if this is even animal cruelty because people are severely injured in these encounters. So they're talking about people with 24 stitches to their face that hit the dog off and are then getting charged under this law. So is that animal cruelty or is that a natural reaction if a dog is sent at your face or at your body and is snarling and biting you as they are trained to do and then you hit that dog? Are you really committing animal cruelty? Is that really what's happening? And then of course, in some cases, the law simply isn't implemented because people die. 
And so frequently we see, as in Jared's case, as in the case of Latra Tuel, a Sudanese man, um, dogs are set upon people. And if they raise their hand or in Latra Tuel's case, he raised the cane as a Sudanese uh, refugee and he was shot dead. So we also see that people end up losing their lives in these encounters. So just quickly, some of the conclusions we can draw from this. So far from transcending the animal-human divide, at every stage of their life and death, police dogs are instrumentalized, weaponized, and rendered disposable. Um, they achieve an adjacency to white humanity in return. And it is white. I say that specifically because we can talk about how whiteness is specifically deployed in service of the state. So these dogs become conditional humans, but only in return for consensually participating in state violence against racialized and oppressed people. And we can also, again, talk about how, again, these dogs move between these kind of states themselves, right? Um, so they're glorified when they die at the hands of suspects, but otherwise they are subject to high rates of physical and psychological injury and isolation that renders their lives extremely precarious. Um, police will use them as a shield against increasing criticism. So the more critique we see of police, the more investment we see in glorifying police dogs, police dog memorials, police dog funerals, police dog obituary, name the police dog. So this is a direct function of critique of police brutality, racial profiling, and other uh, police misconduct. Um, so those of us who talk about these issues, like calling to abolish or defund the police, should also turn our attention to the condition of police animals. So far from being our kind of opposing enemies, when we say, okay, well, the police dog is treated better than we are, we should actually think about how the condition of these dogs actually sheds light on the condition of Black people and Indigenous people who have been animalized through history. We can actually see a co-relationship that should push us to work on behalf of animal rights, not only for these animals, but for other animals as well. Obviously, dogs do not choose to be cops. They cannot consent to this. So um, we understand that all the violence that is done by these dogs is also being done to them fundamentally. The dog is not making a choice here. And in fact, the nature, as they talk about in the police dog manual, it is the nature of your dog to please you. It is the nature of a dog to be obedient. You know, your dog will want to do the task you want it to do. So there's in fact an exploitation of a dog's nature in order to turn them into this weapon. Um, so this violence cannot be ameliorated through an initiative like police dog pension. So if we say, okay, so, Right, the dogs should have health care when they're finished. That doesn't address the fundamental violence of using animals in these acts. Um, so there's no just way to use police dogs, that you can't give the dog a pension or give them health care and then say that's okay. Um, carceral solutions that enhance penalties are not getting to the heart of the harmful systems that harm these animals because state violence is harmful to all of us. And so therefore, when we think about racial justice and liberation of black and indigenous people, we can see that it's tied to animal liberation. So police dogs perhaps exemplify this, but we should also extend that to thinking about the condition of all animals. Because if even these high status animals are subject to this kind of treatment under our violent systems, we can then think about what that means for animal justice. So as a black person, I would say that my liberation is also bound up with the liberation of animals. And I think police dogs exemplify that. So I went a little long, but I will stop there. Thank you.